Uh, hello and welcome to the first episode of Sheltering Places sixth season. Uh, this comeback episode of Sheltering Places features a conversation between Rodrigo Nunes, author of the acclaimed uh, neither, uh, neither Vertical Nor Horizontal, a theory of political organization published by, by Verso Books uh, and uh, our researchers, Rafael Moscardi, Matheus Ferreira, and myself, uh, Cassie Siqueira. Welcome to the first episode uh, of Sheltering Places, sixth season. Just a minute, I'm sorry about that. Uh, in the book, Nunes calls for reevaluating the idea of organization in its political dimension. He addresses the deadlock by which horizontalism and verticalism appears, uh, appear as, as either, either or choices for political action. Contrasting the excessive confidence in horizontalism and localism as models for political action with the recurring preconception that sees an unbreakable link between political organization and the party form, the book boldly reevaluates our contemporary possibilities of political practice. Nunes constructs a critique of self-organization and images of autonomy, advocating for a mix of direct action, state intervention, and the construction of autonomous infrastructure. Uh, in this episode of Sheltering Places, we will ex explore these themes and their social historical contexts, reading the book as a toolkit for formulating strategies and tactics to increase and improve our capacity to act in multiple dimensions. Uh, Rodrigo Nunes is, an active, is active in modern and contemporary philosophy, particularly in the areas of ontology and political philosophy. Authors of, author of the books, Neither Vertical Nor Horizontal, A Theory of Political Organization, and Organization and the Organizationless, Collective Action After Networks. Uh, he has been a visiting professor at, at Goldsmith College, University of London, where he developed and taught the chair of post-war French philosophy. Uh, and I guess we can start now. Uh, thank you all for watching us. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Cassia. Thank you very much, Rodrigo, for coming. We're very happy to have you here. Um, yeah, I'd like to begin with the first question. Like, uh, it's, it's a sort of a general one, but it's one of the things that has really struck me about the book, that uh, one of the central features that I think are to be praised about it is how it recuperates political issues from a recent arc of struggles and also like the political space of action in which we live right now. And however, since you're a philosopher also in terms of uh, like training, there are also some deep philosophical implications and arguments that are made throughout the book that come also, I believe, from your previous work. And uh, this, this has surprised me about the book is that it remains neatly in no genre. So it's neither one of those pure militant uh, conjunctural analysis texts nor as a purely philosophical argument about politics. And uh, just one example of that, like it's an amazing passage that I, that I recall in which you talk about the concepts of form and content and you talk uh, about their implications bringing out Plato, Simon Bon and Kant against Lukacs in the question of organization as a form versus organization as a mediation. And uh, anyway, it, considering that sort of genre breakdown, it could be said that the book seems a little bit odd in a good manner because it constantly tries to mediate between these two uh, sort of already known genres. So the militant text and the philosophical grand argument about politics, but it remains neatly within both. So in this interplay between political theory and political struggle, how would you describe the process of writing the book in general. So like how do Rodrigo the philosopher and Rodrigo the political activist sort of animate the book? And uh, what do you think that like the process through which you wrote the book says about your own, uh, how you picture the relationship between politics and theory? Uh, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think the first thing would be to say that um, uh, Actually, I, I don't think I can work in any other way. Um, so, you know, this oddness is very much the normal for me. Um, I, I mean, on the one hand, so before I, I started, I decided to de dedicate myself to this uh, 
to this question, I'd always, ever since I was writing my PhD, which was very much on like ontological and metaphilosophical questions. Um, so not really directed to politics in any um, explicit way. I had this plan of one day writing a book on the question of organization, just because uh, it was something that I had been thinking about and something that I had been thinking about through the lenses of my philosophical training, uh, but because of the practical problems that presented uh, themselves to me in political practice. I was, I'd been doing politics since, uh, I don't know, the late 90s. Uh, first student politics, then community organizing, then in the uh, outer globalization movement. And I came across a lot of these problems. And obviously, the tools that I had to uh, address those problems were the theoretical tools, tools that I had from my philosophical uh, training. Later on, when I decided that I, instead of uh, working on the project that I was working at the time, which was essentially turning my PhD uh, into a book, which is the more advisable thing to do uh, in career terms, I decided, no, I'm going to write the, the organization uh, book instead, and I'm going to do that first. I was doing that because I thought there is an urgency for it. There is, like, I'm addressing uh, stuff that people are trying to, to work through. Sadly, it took me a time to, it, it took me tons of, some time to find the time to write the book. So, um, some of the movements that I was trying to address didn't exist anymore by the time the, the book came out. But I think it can be useful, uh, both for the people who went through the experiences of the last decade and anyone uh, coming into politics now in this decade. And I think it's highly likely that we're going to see very soon um, other uh, instances of social explosion like we saw at the start of the last decade. I think all the, all the uh, economic and social indicators point in, in this direction. So then hopefully my book will be there to allow, this is always how I describe um, my goal with the, the book that I wanted to write a book that would allow or that would enable people to make different mistakes because I felt that the mistakes being made at the start of the last decade were very similar to the mistakes that we were making a decade before. And there had been no collective learning in the meantime, so I wanted to contribute to that. Going back to the more precise problem of how I wrote it, uh, I would describe, I, I described the method uh, that I was working with. And this, this only became conscious to me as time went, went by, as moving downstream and upstream. So downstream would be the practical problems that I encountered in my own practice and that I could see other people had encountered in their, their own practice and that historical movements had encountered in their practice. And I thought it was possible to trace that back to uh, theoretical decisions that people often made without realizing. You know, people just, the, the, the conceptual grammar that people employed made theoretical decisions for them that they weren't necessarily aware of. And these theoretical decisions that they ended up taking on by using that conceptual grammar caused them problems or created impasses or created dead ends that they couldn't solve. So my idea was, well, you can, if you can trace these practical problems back to these theoretical decisions, then you can solve the theoretical problems or the conceptual problems upstream and then come back downstream to show this problem, this practical problem will now appear in a different light. So that was very much uh, the way I was working um, in the book, which is why, funnily enough, you know, the fact that I was trying all the time to keep it useful, uh, to, to address practical 
questions and to keep it useful for people dealing with the practical problems of political organizing was one of, one of the reasons why I felt that a theory of political organization was necessary because precisely what I realized is the language that we have for talking about these things is a mix and match of conceptual grammars, a mix and match of received ideas, of prejudices, etc. And uh, like this tangle of half-baked ideas uh, or, you know, slogans or cliches is not consistent uh, and it creates lots of problems for us. So the way to try and start the game anew would be to start from scratch. Let's just build a conceptual grammar from scratch, which can also then function as a common language for people who are coming from different political traditions to communicate in. And I'm very happy to say that I've had a few meetings with organizers to discuss the book. And that was one of the, one of the best bits of feedback that I got on it was people saying, this has given us a language to address stuff that we couldn't talk about before because there wasn't a language to describe it, but also like to communicate with uh, one another across political disagreements, across, uh, you know, different perspectives and so on. Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the answer. I, th I think that this is very much felt through, through the book. So I think it's, it's, it ended up being very successful, particularly this part that you said about uh, the sort of unconscious, uh, the unconscious usage of a certain theoretical grammar that then gets reproduced and reproduces problems, uh, problems of theory within organization. I think it's a fascinating point because if you look uh, even through the references that you use, uh, you managed to wrap together a sort of, uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't say a canon, but definitely like a, a large core of references that could be useful in like trying to articulate these concepts and for which there are no shared meanings. And I think that this is the, this is perhaps a, a sort of metapolitical ta uh, task in that sense, because it, it starts bringing shared meanings into these very disparate, uh, disparate conceptions of politics. So I think, I think it definitely uh, enlightens a lot the purpose of the book. Yes, <laughs> I don't know. Should I should I say something else here or? No, we... I think we can move for the for the next questions. We have a lot of questions, so oh. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and then then I'll yeah. It's better if I don't talk at all because my tendency is always to talk too much. No, that's okay. You're welcome to talk. <laughs> Um, Mateus, are you going to ask the next next one? Okay, sorry, I was just thinking it was your time. Um, so anyway, good that we have that clarified. Um, so Rodrigo, um, one one of the very interesting things um, in your book is, and I think it is one of the the central issues, is that. Go getting straight to the title. Um, we say neither vertical nor horizontal, but this is not about, I'd say, um, not about a virtuous mean um, going in a diagonal path or something like that. And the issue is, as you say already in the first chapter, and making reference to a common vocabulary in these discussions of political organization about having the molecular and molar aspects complementing and reinforcing each other. So revolutionary processes to use um, this loaded term are always a combination of molecular and molar revolutions or of aggregate and collective action as you put it as well. The two necessarily have to go together, interpenetrate and feed back into one another. So um, getting, getting to the point, the influence of Deleuze and Guattari has clearly been important to your work in particular, as well as mark the whole tradition, particularly the ones leaning towards the molecular or horizontal aspects of politics. But by reading your book, you don't seem to think their approach was intended to blind people to the importance of macro politics and molar organizational practice. How do you think Deleuze and Guattari's discussion 
of molarity, molecularity in politics influenced your work? Why do you think they are usually associated solely with the molecular or horizontal dimensions? And, and how do you see the issue of complementarity? Like, is all molar action also a molecular process? Are all macro, micro politics a part of larger macro political processes? Should we strive um, then again um, for some sort of diagonal path in between them? Or should we um, combine like a more contextual complex um, techniques like as you say, thinking organization as pharmacon, or even having a trans individual perspective that would um, crisscross these these oppositions, something like that. So um, yeah, I guess there's a already a lot of questions. So please repeat. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, yeah. I'll I'll try to start from the easiest ones. Why have why have Deleuze and Guattari being read as setting up uh, an opposition between the molar and the molecular, between uh, the micro and macro political, so on and so forth. And to, to a lesser extent, I mean, you don't, you don't it's really funny that in, in the case of, um, in the case of Foucault, this dualistic, vocabulary is missing and deliberately so because precisely it is Foucault's point that like the the um that there is no good power and bad power there's just power but then it's very interesting that people like uh Maurizio Lazzarato or um, uh Hart and Negri will read back these dualism into Foucault and propose, for example, a, a distinction between biopower and biopolitics that's completely absent from Foucault's work. Why did that happen? Um, well, that's kind of one of the major interventions that the, the book is trying to do, I'd say. Um, it's, um, you know, there's, um, I, I say that the, the, the book, that neither vertical nor horizontal can, consists of a theoretical intervention. It's trying to develop a theory of political organization, this common language uh, in which we can all pose the, the problems, the practical problems we face anew, as it were. Um, it's a historical intervention in the sense of understanding the transformations of our broader conceptual uh, grammars uh, to talk about social transformation. So there is this, the, the longest chapter in the book is a, a chapter about the history of the idea of revolution from the early modern period until now and how it's been uh, transformed since. But there's, a, not, there's a, a conjunctural intervention, which is sort of trying to draw a balance sheet of what happened in the last decade to ask, okay, what is it that we learned in, with the movements of the last decade and how they developed or how they were defeated, the impasses that they ran up against, et cetera. But there's also a conjunctural, conjunct, conjunctural um slash historical intervention um, that's also theoretical, um, which is relating to what I think is a theoretico-political conjuncture that is established at some point in the 80s. Um, and I mean, starts coming together in the late 70s, but becomes fully becomes the mainstream, as it were, in, uh, in critical thought in the 90s, which is precisely the conjuncture in which the very clear signs in people like Foucault and Deleuze and Guattari, uh, because these are very explicit. These are not, you know, I'm not reading anything into them, like I'm, you know, I can quote several passages in which they stress this. You have to think these things together. They become separated and people 
people tend to interpret, uh, let's say broadly, post-structuralist thought as arguing for those uh, dualisms. Why does that happen? I, I think it's pretty obvious if you look at the broader uh, political context. It's uh, the trauma of the, it's the, the hangover of actually existing socialism. It's the crisis of uh, Marxism towards the end of um, the, the 70s from, from then onwards. Um, it's the, um, the discredit on the one hand of the existing organizational infrastructure that had been dominant throughout of, you know, the, the workers' movement uh, as in the form that it had been known since the 19th century until uh, the, the beginning of uh, the rise of uh, new liberalism, but also the dismantling of that, uh, of that infrastructure. So for example, when Deleuze and Guattari write in the 80s, um, we must resist, even if it's in very small places. Um, it's, to me, it's very clear that what, what they're saying is not, we must resist in small places because small places are good, big places are bad, therefore resistance must always be small. What they're saying is there's no big place to go now. So we have to try and keep the flame alive in however small spaces we have. Um, and it, it is true that I'd say more Deleuze than, I, 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 I always say this, and I'm organizing an event about on the uh, 50th anniversary of, uh, the anti, of Anti-Oedipus. Um, and this is definitely gonna be part of my presentation of that. Uh, event. People, there's a tendency for people to say um, that Anti-Oedipus was where the bad activist Guattari led the good philosopher Deleuze astray. And for me, it's often the other way around. It's the book where the good philosopher Deleuze leads the good activist Guattari astray to cut a long story short, by, by virtue, I think it's always Deleuze's um, Bergsonism that's to blame. It's when Bergs, Bergson takes over that things um, go bad because then there is a tendency towards a dualism in, uh, in Deleuze. But at the same time, if you read, um, if you read the stuff that Watari writes before Anti-Oedipus, or if you read even the, the um, Deleuze's introduction to uh, Guattari's Psychoanalysis and Transversality, which was republished as, um, uh, it's, it's called uh, Trois Problèmes de Groupe in French. So three group problems, I can't remember what it is, but it, it would be that, I guess, three group problems in, in English. Um, which I always describe as being the place where you find Deleuze's theory of political organization, which is where he's responding directly to Guattari's thought rather than philosophizing all over it. Um, it that is completely different from this uh, stereotypical picture of, you know, Deleuze and Guattari as advertising a dualism of the, uh, the macro versus the micro political or the, the molar versus the molecular. And in a way, uh, I said this in, in an interview uh, that I gave about the book, in a way, what I'm, I was trying to do with the book was just to draw the um, and I would say, I would say moreover, that especially in Foucault's case, but also in Deleuze's and in Deleuze Guattari's case, at least in, apart from the moments when uh, Bergson 
takes over, when Deleuze's Bergsonism takes over. Um, but when, when uh, Deleuze manages to keep the Bergson in his head in check, the, their, entire, their entire theory, I, I would say, would be inconsistent with the politics, with that sort of dualistic politics. I think the theory points in the opposite direction. I think there is a certain level of indeterminacy between your theoretical premises and the, the theoretical premises of a thought and the practical inferences that a thinker might draw from that. I think the thought is always bigger than the thinker. The thinker is the operator that makes choices at certain bifurcation points, but it's always possible to go back to those choices and say, well, what if we take this direction? And obviously they were thinking in a very different conjuncture, especially from the mid seventies onwards, they were thinking within a very different conjuncture uh, from the one we're thinking in, which means that, you know, they, they, they would probably be, um, they would probably lean towards certain choices at these bifurcation points that we wouldn't make nowadays, or we, that we wouldn't think would be helpful uh, to make today. But I thought one of the things that I was trying to do was just to develop the theory of political organization that was already there, that they didn't fully develop, or that, you know, that is sketched in texts like this text by, um, by Deleuze or in uh, Intellectuals in Power, that dialogue between Deleuze and Foucault, or in a lot of uh, Guattari's texts from the 60s and the, the early 70s. So they have, I believe that um, they have remained absolutely central to me. Uh, and I believe that I have remained absolutely faithful to them. I just think my faithfulness to them is different from other people's faithfulness, but I believe my faithfulness is actually more faithful to where the, the theory is going and trying to, and, you know, trying to separate the conclusions that they might have taken at a different conjuncture from the thought and the conclusions that we might draw from that thought in our conjunction. I think I, I addressed like 2% of the questions that you asked, but you know. No, it's, yeah, it's okay. It, it, was, it was a very, very good answer. And I think, yeah, I, I think this, this, shows, this shows us also um, how Deleuze and Guattari can still be, be relevant today in a in a different key, I mean, because, um, yeah, I I will try to address this in, in another question. So uh, I'll probably just try not to to jump um, ahead of myself. But it, it is it is interesting that we can still do different things with with these um, same same sort of of references and and try not to stay too focused on paths already taken. Something like that, I'd say. Um, but yeah, th thanks a lot, Rodrigo. And especially when those paths, when like experience tells us that those paths had have led us to dead ends. So yeah, to continue to go down a dead end in the hope that it will stop being a dead end may not be the best way of dealing with with those choices. Yeah, sure. Uh, Rodrigo, uh, I'm going to ask something. I was reading your book and two particular uh, quotes called a lot my attention. So I'm going to briefly read them and follow up with a question. Uh, you write that as we fear precisely that which we would need in order to give our desires a practical form, we are constantly running up against the limits of the, that capacity. But since overcoming those limits would re require confronting our, our fears, we often prefer to rationalize that need away and convince ourselves that powerlessness is a form of virtue. 
And in, in another uh, place writes, uh, the first and most element elementary is that there needs to be no kind of coordination or even co direct contact, contact among the different components of an ecology for them to interact with one another. By acting on their shared environments, they can indirectly shape each other's fields of possibilities. So in touch with uh, the, the character of these quotes, I would like to ask, to ask how do you see uh, the current state of generalized apathy under the perspective of the needs for sticking with powerlessness as a virtue, uh, as you describe, and with regards to the what, how do you see uh, the actual uh, uh, ways we can trace or, or track uh, the distribution of power that is somehow inescapable in a, in a social field, but is somehow uh, negated by this, uh, uh, this claim, uh, reclaims of powerlessness. Uh, and also, do you think that this post-pandemic moment contribu contributed to uh, some sorts of rearrangements of forms of organization as this complex ecology, as well as uh, a possible update of the force that are, that are being dealt with uh, in this uh, new ways or possible new ways of organizing to, to achieve political effects? So it's whether the pandemic has changed things. The previous one was, first one was apathy. What was the second one? Right. Powerlessness. Right. What about As a it? virtue. Right. Um, well, I think I, it's, it's interesting that you put it in terms of uh, generalized apathy because it's actually, it's not true, I would say, that people are apathetic. Um, I mean, I, uh, I, I, one would feel um, inclined here to use the, that term that uh, Zizek likes so much, which if I remember correctly is from uh, Hobbit Fowler originally, uh, interpassivity, and I think Interpassivity. Funnily enough, I think this 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 was this may have been a, a diagnosis that was ahead of its time, uh, in the sense that um, it first comes up before the age of social media. Um, but I, in certain ways, nothing describes better the age of social media than this category of interpassivity, because. I'd say it's just not true that people are apathetic. On the contrary, people are talking about politics nonstop. But they precisely what uh, social media does is to elide the difference between doing politics and being seen as doing politics. Um, I remember, I remember something I wrote once, I think when the, when one, one of the mining, the recent, uh, mining disasters in Brazil happened, uh, I wrote a text for, uh, for the newspaper, for Folha de São Paulo, um, about it. And there was a critique of a certain form of environmentalism which my environmentalist friends call market environmentalism. And my environmentalist friends, i.e. people who work in the environmental movement, who work for environmental organizations, uh, who organize around environmental issues, they knew exactly what I was talking about. And in fact, I was using their critique of this form of environmentalism that they call, that they call market environmentalism in my text. But I noticed a bunch of people uh, were a bit, they seemed to be a bit reticent about the, the, the text, who I thought would agree with what I said, and I couldn't understand why. And a while later, I saw one of these people who I thought reacted in a, in a, in a slightly 
funny way to the the text tweeting someone is at something saying we environmentalists blah blah and then i understood right this person must have thought that i was talking about them but i would never dream of it describing them as an environmentalist um like that there's someone who talk about the environment on twitter which is different for me from an environmentalist but obviously this person felt that they were an environmentalist because um because they talked about it on twitter um so you know everyone everyone is talking about politics all the time everyone is expressing solidarity with all sorts of different causes and all sorts of different different groups uh all the time but it is true that and, and you know what's the so in I, in in one of the talks i was giving here in uh berlin the one i gave on on thursday uh which was to a project that that is on the concept of solidarity i was saying that characteristic uh the paradigmatic the irony of our situation is you could say we live in a golden age of solidarity you know you open twitter every day and there's solidarity for anything pretty much anything that you can possibly imagine um but the paradigmatic organizational infrastructure of solidarity today is private gigantic private communication companies like we don't have uh you know that that there's very little we live in a golden age of solidarity but most of that golden age of solidarity is just expressed through social media and doesn't really translate into an organizational infrastructure um in, into its own organizational infrastructure i'd say that to a certain extent that is no doubt because we still live uh within what i describe uh in in the book as the trauma of organization this trauma left by uh the experiences of uh mass organization at scale of the 20th century um that leaves people with this feeling that well the, uh, some organi organization is okay if it's at, it's if it's very local if it's very small but if you try to build that if you try to expand that organizational infrastructure bad things will happen and therefore um you know it's best if you if you stay there and nowadays the the like in a way the illusion that we have uh since the age of uh web 2.0 is that well anyway you don't need this organizational infrastructure anymore because you have like these private companies that uh provide us with this organizational infrastructure but the truth is this organizational infrastructure that facebook twitter uh google etc provide us with it's good for certain things it's certainly useful for certain things but not for others and there's a bunch of stuff that we can't do but we still get this sense of oh look at how much we we can achieve if you know we managed to cancel someone who, which is never actually true that someone no one ever gets canceled but you know if we managed to cancel uh, a transphobe or a racist or you know whatever um we you know we have we have this hit of oh look you know this is people power we've managed to do this but you know we we get this out of the fact of these very local moments of redressing imbalances in public discourse or 
uh, you know, in access to, um, to public goods, et cetera. But we are, we're actually not doing that much to, to change the structural conditions of public discourse or of access to public goods or anything else. We have this illusion that in the long term, out of you know, each person that we cancel, structural change is, is coming. Um, but actually it isn't. And actually we don't have, for that sort of change, we don't really have the organizational infrastructure at the moment, but because we're afraid of giving ourselves that sort of organizational infrastructure or even posing uh, the question of it. And this private infrastructure gives us a, a regular, a constant illusion that we're getting somewhere. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm, there's, don't get me wrong, there's lots of good stuff that can be done through social media, but it's, I find it highly unlikely that in and of itself, it will lead to the kind of structural change that we're looking for. Um, so I, I would put, I'm just saying, I would put the, 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 I would describe the situation in slightly different terms to the ones you put. I, I think people are not apathetic. Um, and, and it's not simply, as I say it in the book, that they're thinking of powerlessness as a virtue. Nowadays, we get a sense of power from things that we can achieve through um, social media, but it's still not the kind of power we would need to affect structural change. And that's where the trauma of organization kicks in. And that's where people go, well, this kind of organizational infrastructure, let's not go there. That's dangerous. And maybe we don't need that because we look at all the stuff that, all the stuff that we've managed to do on, on social media. So yeah, it's, and, and you know, I'm, I'm disagreeing with the terms in which you put the question, but it's, I'm also disagreeing with the, the terms in which the question is phrased in the book because it's phrased in a lot more uh, general way. And I, I, I would say that the way I just phrased it would be like the more, um, uh, the more complete or the more precise way of framing it in our present conjuncture now. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, Rafael, are you going to ask the next one? Next one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, th th this has been very interesting, like uh, especially the, the mention you, you just made about, uh, about social media. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get into that a little bit later. But one, another thing that I, that I wanted to ask you about was about, uh, there, there is a, a concept which I think uh, appears throughout the book. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't uh, receive like an exhaust, uh, like a extensive treatment. But when it appears, I think it's it's in a very crucial junctures for the book, which is the concept of a politics with the subject in. And uh, I, I remember that you you mentioned it as the realization that it is precisely because we are implicated in the process that envelop us that we must implicate our own subjective position and activity into every objective analysis of things. So this turns every non-committal question regarding what should happen into one of what about what can be done now from our partial perspective and with the uh, with the limited resources we have at hand in order to bring ourselves closer to it. And then this is very nice. Lenin, so responsibility for producing effects via second order cybernetics, so consciousness of one's own partiality. And uh, yeah, this, this phrasing in general, and also the way that the concept is emulated throughout the books, puts you pretty close to the tradition of political realism, which you explore via Machiavelli, for instance. And uh, I remember like this, uh, these resonances with Machiavelli have been very important for my, my own reading of the book, because I was coincidentally, I was reading uh, Althusser's writings on Machiavelli at the same time. So it was very interesting to see some resonance and, uh, like over there, very unexpected also. But uh, also, uh, it's not necessarily, what, what is uh, talked about, about this, uh, the realism that you try to advance is not necessarily a deflation of expectations, but a commitment to thinking about action and mat with material constraints in mind, so with the own circumstances. 
that permeate it. And uh, I think it's interesting uh, that Cassia mentioned apathy because I think apathy is the language uh, that also we use. Like it's this sort of imprecise language which we use to talk about uh, the the sort of the affective feeling we get from being within this situation which you described very well through the example of social media. And uh, in that context, I'd, I'd like to hear from you a bit about uh, what are the difficulties that you see in political organization, which you believe are endemic to the forms you point out uh, as the crucial forms of contemporary politics. So uh, the platform and the ecology in a way. And uh, what do you believe are the most crucial to be overcome in the, cur in the current cycle of struggles we are having right now? And what do you think this say about the future? And uh, I, I, I'd like you, if you could, because Ka Kasia, is, uh, I think Kasia unveiled and your answer also unveiled a very good dimension between sort of these objective challenges because of the forms of the contemporary forms, which are more frequent for organization. And, uh, but also there is a, a sort of a personal thing uh which is like i think that while you do the a sort of therapeutic uh a, approach to the trauma of organization if we may uh, have this freedom uh, there is also a problem which like there is also the translation of that objective constraint into a subject a subjective feeling and perhaps the language through which this subjective feeling has been formulated has been the language of apathy has been the language of uh, like this deflate uh uh, deflation of realism, as in Mark Fisher, for example. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to hear what you make of that that certain that description. So, rephrase the question in one sentence. Yeah. So mainly, Again, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, mainly like about the because you're talking about the distinction between a subjective and uh, an objective constraints. So I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about first how uh, what do you think are the main challenges of these objective forms, the platform of the ecology, and also how they translate into very subjective affects and feelings for the contemporary political subject while organizing. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, um, the with reference to what you said about political realism. Um, I mean, it's it's very it's very funny that you were reading those Artisar, uh texts because I was reading them right at the start of this project, um, and I was I was reading them alongside uh, Pierre Clast, which is a very you know a very peculiar triangulation probably Clast uh, Machiavelli and uh, I'll just say, um, but is actually, I, I wrote a text about it at the time and that does come through again in a lot of the book, I would say. Um, and I would say that both with, um, with pretty much uh, everything that I've written in <laughs> since the 2008, uh, crisis, uh, but you know, specifically with what a lot of what I'm trying to theorize in uh, neither vertical nor horizontal, but also the political argument that I'm making in the um, trans from from trans to vertigo, which is the book that's just come out in Brazil in in Portuguese, sadly in Portuguese only uh, now. But you know if if you're listening to this and you would like to translate it, please get in touch. Um, where And I, I was having this conversation, I was having precisely this conversation uh, with a friend yesterday who is like much, much more on the issue of June 2013, the June 2013 protests in Brazil, he would take much more the PT, the Workers' Party line, and he described me uh, yesterday as a juniste, as a, a partisan of June, which which I'm not. You know, I I, I think it's a fair description, and I I, I own it. Um, what I've been a lot of what I've been trying to do is through 
uh, the lens of political, because there is, there, this uh, or one of one of the things that helped me with this there is this very weird reading of political realism uh, which is which seems to presume that you can't be realistic and ambitious at the same time uh, like if you recognize the existing constraints then you will know that you cannot be ambitious and it's like well but the whole point of real one of the entire points of realism is constraints change all the time. So you can be ambitious if you're thinking at the same time about acting within existing constraints and acting to transform those constraints. Um, and this is, and it, it was precisely that move in, in the argument. A lot of the time I, I build my arguments as you know, arguments that I'm having with the voices in my head. And one of the things that, especially after 2013, one of the moves that I wanted to make impossible was precisely, you know, like this friend yesterday saying, oh yeah, but the problem is you ignore uh, realpolitik. And I say, no, I believe, I 100% believe in realpolitik. And I think you're doing it wrong. Because what happened to PT was precisely, you know, it assumed a, a, a realpolitik, the inevitability of realpolitik, and it said, well, we have to make concessions. But it acted as if there were a fixed quantum of concessions that you would make. And if you made that many concessions, then you would find like ideal. Uh, conditions of equilibrium that would remain stable forever. And then you could do all the other things that you intended to do. And the thing is, well, if you make concessions and you're not at the same time working to make yourself stronger than the people you are making concessions to, in all likelihood, you're gonna have to make more and more concessions over time. You know, if, if you're not working to change the, first of all, if the condition of equilibria of if the conditions of equilibrium change, then you know, you're done for because you didn't have a plan B. Your original plan was just, we make these concessions and then things will be okay. But these conditions of equilibrium are changing all the time. So if they change and you don't have a plan B, you're done for, which is kind of what happened to, to PT. But also they will tend to change over time in such ways that you're not, if you're not preparing for different conditions of equilibrium and if you of equilibrium and you're not preparing to um, draw those conditions of equilibrium in, to pull those conditions of equilibrium in your direction, then it's likely that in, at some point in the future, you will be much weaker than you were when uh, this realpolitik uh, began. And why is that, why is it important to make that point now? Well, because I don't think we can afford anything else politically at the moment than being ambitious. The, the most obvious example of that is climate change. Of course, um, you know, there is this, this sentence, this slogan in the, that's been around in the environmental movement for a while, which I like very much. And I used it in a text and some people thought it, it I came up with the sentence and I had to tell them that sadly it wasn't mine. Um, but it's uh, a slogan that says, at this point, winning slowly is as good as losing, which I think, you know, it's a perfect summary of where we're at. Um, so you cannot, in a situation like that, you cannot afford but to be ambitious in, in the same way uh, economic inequality and as a consequence, consequence of economic in, inequality, um, the inequalities 
in political power uh, have uh, accumulated so much over the last four decades that you need a strong push at this point, even to do reforms at this point. I, that would be another way to, 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 to say it. At this point, even to do reforms, you need to be a revolutionary. You need to push very hard to achieve even mild reform. And I think that's one of the lessons of the last uh, decade. You know, we had mass movements all around the world uh, for, regi for regime change, uh, for economic change, for political change. And the system just grew used to functioning with very low levels of political legitimacy. And they, they've just carried on. And they could afford to wait out the protesters and say, well, at, this, at some point they are gonna give up and they're gonna go back home and then things can continue as normal. And they were proved right, uh, we, we have to say, which is another reason why we need to, to discuss the question of uh, organization today. Um, So in a way, I, I, think, I think there's definitely a huge level and you know, you're, all, um, you're all younger than me, so I'm, I'm sure you feel this much more strongly. Um, I would say there's definitely like a strong level of, um, of ambient dread and um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say resignation um, or maybe we could say there's a strong level of uh, resignation in the sense that you know every a lot of people feel that all things remaining equal um, you know we're going to hell in a handbasket um, but And, and that uh, chances are that, you know, that all the evidence points to things remaining equal. Um, but at the same time, I think this resignation can very easily flip into something else. Um, because this is exactly what it felt like at the start of the last decade. You know, Mark Fisher's diagnosis came out precisely in that interval between the 2008 crisis and 2000 and the Arab Spring and everything that came afterwards, which was precisely a moment when we, when, when we were feeling this is it, you know, everything should have changed. People should have been furious and nothing happened. And then suddenly something happened. So I think there is a, um, there is a combination of maybe, maybe, maybe instead of resignation, we we could call it passive anger. There is there is an effective tone of passive anger, which, given the opportunity, can very easily turn into active anger. Um, and and then you know once it becomes active anger, it doesn't look like resignation anymore because I think ultimately the situation where we're in now is the challenges are enormous. You know, we cannot afford but to be ambitious at this point. The conditions are very unfavorable, but at the time, and I think this is the situation in which we have lived since 2008, the potential is very large to, and it could go one way or another. You know, we saw in the second half of the last decade, it go in the opposite direction. We're actually farther from addressing the, the things we need to address now because of the rise of the far right, which takes place precisely in the vacuum left by those 
protest of the start of the, the decade. You know, they create their own backlash, but at the same time, you know, they leave a vacuum of, okay, who's addressing the, these anti-systemic feelings or who are, who's addressing this passive fear? And then suddenly the far right comes along and they take, take up that space. They occupy that uh, vacuum which is part of why the situation is, uh, the conditions are unfavorable now. But I think it's very important that we bear this in mind. You know, if, if anything is gonna happen, it's gonna be now. This, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a very interesting decade. Um, and we have to be ready for that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Matt, I, I guess Mateus has another question, but I have a really quick one uh, before that, because I remember I was at FOSU uh, at your talk in 2019. I actually performed at the event too. Uh, and I remember the title of your talk was uh, Communization, Populism and Accelerationism, uh, two, uh, Three Paths for the Left. And uh, the first two, uh, populism and communization, are thematized in your book, but uh, left accelerationism goes uh, somehow unmentioned. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, two, uh, one or two texts by Nick Cernicek, but the subject of our acceleration is, is left unmentioned. If you could uh, quickly comment upon that, because uh, left accelerationism is also known for uh, uh, another critique of localism and horizontalism uh, and the problem of scale is also important. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's important to, to start for, for full disclosure for people who are, um, who are watching this. Uh, both Mateus and Rafael have uh, attended uh, courses that I gave at some point. Um, graduate courses that I gave at some point. And then in Cassia's case, she never attended any of my um, courses, but I saw her DJ uh, at Forsu once. And it was great, by the way, we didn't talk that night, but it, it, it was great, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I mean, there is, there is a kind of, I guess there was a kind of strategic silence on, on my part in relation to left accelerationism in the book. Um, in, in the sense that um, first, I mean, uh, so um, Nick Cernicek and uh, Alex Williams are friends of mine. I'm actually doing in, Two weeks time, I'm doing an event with Nick in um, uh, in London. Uh, I've written a blurb for uh, the book that Alex and Jem Gilbert have just written. Um, so, you know, we've and yeah, we've we've known each other for a while. We've been in, in communication for a while, and I think we've been developing very similar ideas uh, to one another, both in parallel and in conversation with, with one another uh, for some time. For example, um, Nick and Alex in uh, inventing the future in like the second edition where there's like a, a response to some criticisms of the book, they, you know, they, they make some, some very generous uh, comments on, they'd already mentioned organization of the organization list in the first edition, and then they make some very generous comments in uh, this afterward uh, about uh, organization of the organization list. Um, and same thing with Jeremy, Jeremy Gilbert, whom I've known for an even longer time. Um, my friend Kia Milburn, who's also in conversation with them, so on and so forth. But I had the impression that at the moment when I was writing uh, the book, 
A, exactly, precisely because I knew what uh, Alex and Nick and other people were working on at that moment. Uh, I had the impression that accelerationism was in flux, like the, or left accelerationism was in flux. Like the, the second wave of left accelerationist texts was gonna be quite different from, from the first. And there was gonna be, um, in fact, this, the, the disagreements that I had with the first wave would probably be solved in this second wave of texts, but the second wave didn't exist yet. Um, so it was difficult to refer to, so it was a moment when like pe people had one picture of left, of left accelerationism. And I expected something that it was, that the picture was going to change, but the picture hadn't changed yet. So it was difficult to, you know, there was a danger of trying to talk about it, but then talking about a picture that I knew to, to be old, but probably most people wouldn't have the same, uh, uh, most people would be relating to that picture as, you know, no, this is what left accelerationism is and so on. There's definitely, to cut a long story short, I, 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 I would say that there's, there's definitely um, my agreement with uh, Nick and Alex, for example, has definitely grown over time. Um, Maybe because they've changed more than than I have. I, I think. I think. I think the 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 original manifesto was very much. It was a manifesto, and I think it has to be read within that genre. Like there's, I'm I'm I've no doubt that there are claims there that they would be a lot more cautious around uh, nowadays, or that they would find it necessary to nuance, or maybe uh, maybe even one or two that they might regret uh, nowadays. And I think because, because of that, because of the genre that it was written in, because it was written as a manifesto, you know, this very high modernist, which is, you know, the, the, a, a literary genre that both supposes and evokes this very high modernist pathos of like, you know, uh, or in the or in in the particular case, uh, les activistes. Um, you know, they <laughs> they wanted to shock activists out of uh, the folk politics, etc. And I thought, well, I that's not an approach I personally would want to to take. I think. Uh, and I think it might have created, at the same time that it was useful in the sense of drawing a lot of attention to, to the text, and deservedly so, because I think it was a very timely and very generous, it has proved itself over time, a very timely and a very generative uh, intervention. Um, at the same time, I think it created, it may have created some uh, unnecessary noise around a lot of what they were saying. So I was, I was definitely going in a very similar direction. And the, the things you mentioned, like, uh, you know, questions of scale, uh, a, a critique of localism, uh, you know, these are definitely things that we, we share and that we have shared for, uh, for a long time. Like, from the first time we met one another, we knew that we shared these questions, but I was trying to get at these things through a different path. I think my intervention tries to be a lot more healing um, than uh, you can afford to be in a manifesto. You know, a manifesto is by definition a very, it always supposes a, an aggressive gesture. It always supposes a rupture. And I was trying to do the exact 
opposite. I was trying to, I was trying to unmake ruptures. I was trying to say, look, all, all, all these oppositions um, that we, we're operating with, they're actually unnecessary and, uh, and they're not helping us in any way. They're actually preventing us from posing the problems that we could pose in common, that we could all find a common language uh, around. But, you know, I think, I think there is uh, a lot of complementarity between what they do and, and what I do. And, you know, another concept we share, which is the concept of uh, the organizational ecology, which I've tried to develop further in, to, yeah, to flash out, flesh out more in this, in neither vertical nor horizontal. I think we very much, uh, I have the impression that we very much see one another in those terms. Like we see uh, what we're doing as, you know, being stuff that's different and that's coming at similar things from uh, different angles, but at the same time is like in a very, in a very, uh, A, it's contributing to the same ecology, B, it's trying to make very similar contributions to, to that ecology, and C, in several respects, we're very close to one another within that uh, ecology. So yeah, this, it, you said it was a, a, a short question, but it ended up being a very long answer. Thank you so much for that. I think it really helped to clarify the relation between both things, both projects, and uh, and it uh, really answers for uh, yeah. It was it was going to be really difficult to trying to describe something that you already see uh, changing at the same time. I get it, uh, but uh, thank you a lot. And Mateus, are going to ask another one? Yeah, yeah. And I had one, just one more question. And I think it is pretty, pretty related to, well, the, this discussion with, uh, with Left Excel as well. And, and with the previous one, you, Rodrigo and, and Rafael were going about, because I, I wanted to ask about the, the issue we, we get into in, in two left melancholias um, about we have in, in, in our particular organization of ecology or in the historical left um, feud of the organizational ecology, two distinct um, lefts, and one that would be sort of, um, well, perhaps you could call it a, a molecular one, um, focused on the, the localist, um, in, in the left Excel terms, it would be the, the folk political um, people, um, and the other side would have um, a more perhaps hegemony-centered and unitarian, the molar sort of left. And you characterize these as, as having, um, as, as perhaps we could, we could call them, the 1917 left and the 1968 left. Um, and yeah, it, it is common for the, historically for these groups to, to blame each other for the problems we're having and, and things like that. But you, you suggest that the organizational question could become the mediator for these things, for these two different fields, um, perhaps to, to actually st start talking in, um, to one another and, and making the desire for revolution a concrete thing um, and put it back into the game, perhaps. So, um, yeah, the question is particularly you say you suggest that 2011 and the cycle related to the Arab Spring to the June journeys here in Brazil could be in a similar relation to the 1968 left politics, as the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 was to the political ideals and forms of the 1917 um, left. So um, yeah, could you perhaps expand an, a bit on that and and tell us. What do you think this implies about the, the 2010 decade and the 2020s to come? Um, are we in, 
in a, in an analogical relation to the neoliberal consensus of the 1990s. I mean, um, all the hope, all our hopes of change um, were liquidated in 2011. Or perhaps are we in the time to reinvent some sort of third generation of left politics? And as, as, as for example, the people in the idea of communism symposium back in 2009 were really hopeful that, oh, this time we get it, this time we're, we're gonna have a, a different communism and, and something like that. And so do you, do you see this happening? And do you think um, organization, the, the discussion of organization as mediation and of an ecological orientation and an, eco an ecology of organizations are these interesting ideas for which to think about uh, a new generation of left politics or something like that? I mean, that's definitely what I was trying to contribute to both in the negative uh, sense, um, negative as in I wanted to prevent the, or uh, prevent is perhaps a bit too much. I wanted to help people not to make the same mistakes again, um, but also positive, positive in the sense uh, that, you know, I wanted to offer people a different language and a different conceptual grammar and within which they could pose problems that I found to be more productive. Um, and finally, in a performative sense. So when, when I make that statement, uh, which um, I'm really, I'm really glad that um, you, you brought this up because I always complain at events. I haven't managed to have that many, as many events on the book as I would have liked because obviously it came out during the pandemic. But I've been complaining at events that one, one thing that people never pull me up on is precisely that sentence. Um, you know, where I say, maybe one day we'll, we'll recognize 2011 was the 1989 of 1968. Um, that is, saying that is obviously a performative gesture as well. Like I'm trying to make people see themselves in that statement, recognize that statement as yes, no, this is, um, this describes where I am at or this describes where we are at now. Um, and I think it, going back to Cassia's question, um, you know, Cassia raised this, uh, presentation that I did uh, at Forsu where I was talking about populism, uh, communization, and uh, accelerationism. When, when the, the outer globalization movement fizzled out, the more traditional left went, oh yeah, we always knew this was going to happen because, you know, these horizontalists, they're absolutely useless. Uh, this was always what was going to be the case. And then the horizontalists were like, yeah, I mean, we never, we always knew that you couldn't trust these verticalists and, you know, um, you know, let's make sure we never work with them again. So everyone came out of a, an experience of defeat which you could argue was mostly caused by the complete shift in global politics that was brought about by 9-11. Ultimately, it had nothing to do with verticalism versus horizontalism. It was, you know, suddenly the war on terror came to define global politics and that completely changed the landscape in which we were uh, operating in, in ways that we could do nothing about, we couldn't intervene in. Um, but you know, it's significant that you came to the end of the movement there and everyone's reaction was, yeah, we were right all along. We knew this was gonna happen. 
you have in the last decade, you have this very horizontalist first moment. And then after it fizzles out, some people remain faithful to those ideas, but other people, they, that's precisely the moment when people become interested in when these things appear or people become interested or become interested again in communization theory, in left accelerationism and in um, populism. So instead of, you know, th there's an important difference there. Instead of everyone drawing the conclusion, yes, we were right all along, everyone starts casting about for different ideas, for different paths. And I think that is, that for me, I would say is one of the signs that something changed. Um, why this, this happened, I think maybe because millennials, like later millennials were already carrying a lot less historical baggage like there there is the later millennials the people who come of age uh politically um with the 2011 the the the, the cycle of struggles that begins in 2011 um they had no memory of what happened before, which means that act, there's actually a two decade gap between the fall of the Berlin Wall and them, which is completely empty. And I think that lack of memory also meant a lack of, meant on the one hand that they were making the same mistakes that an earlier generation had made as if they were super original. Um, but on the other hand, it also meant that uh, they were less encumbered by dogmatic allegiances. That would be one thing. I think another thing is they are structurally a lot more precarious, a lot more fragile than earlier than any earlier generation since uh, boomers, which you know that was a pre. That, that was a generation that went on for a while. They're still around, in fact. Um, but, um, so, you know, there's a, I, I guess there's a sense of urgency for younger people that comes from much greater structural uh, precariousness that also makes people less tied to dogma. Um, and the third thing is that maybe there, there, was, there was also, it, it all happened too quickly. Like in, in a matter of months, maybe, you went from feeling that nothing was possible to everything was possible to nothing was possible again. And, and I think that expansion and shrinking of horizons made people a lot more, you know, that was just, that just pushed people to look for solutions rather than sticking to, to dogma. So I think there's definitely, like among you know, people your, of your uh, age, there's definitely a lot of potential to come. There's a, there's a lot of objective potential for social upheaval. Uh, in in the next years, and I think there's a lot of uh, subjective potential for like, coming into social upheaval with a different set of questions, with a different set of assumptions, and with a much more um, flexible, a much more nimble approach that's really willing to experiment with different uh, things and play with a full deck of cards, because basically what I was arguing against uh, with this idea of uh, a double melancholia that keeps, keeps us stuck in this framework where we feel like we always have to choose 
between this or that is that it prevents us from using the full um, wealth of ideas and forms and uh, you know, uh, analyses that we could be employing. Um, so yeah, I'm, in that sense, I would, I would say I'm quite hopeful and optimistic that the, the book may be proven correct in, in relation to that uh, diagnosis. interesting yeah yeah it is and i yeah i don't know i just hope we your your predictions go um go go as you say because it, it would be really good if we could really get into i don't know more social upheaval and then in a different in a different key yeah and i think the the the, the good thing is if i'm wrong yeah. we'll all die pretty fast so no one's going to remember i was wrong True thing, true thing. Yeah, this is this is a, a good point. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, I, I think the the idea of um, an organizational ecology for me it's it has been um, very interesting to to think about all these issues and and how to perhaps um, make a, yeah make left politics in in a different way, not to to see that everyone is is a possible adversary or. Or a reformist, a revisionist, a, a traitor to the cause, but that we can, in a way, contribute in different manners to, well, similar goals. And I think um, when when we are in this in this urgency, as you described, um, there are too many similar goals that we should just immediately be working towards. That I think we have, we we can easily. Um, have more to to unite us than to to divide different um, factions, and I think the the as you say the grammar of a an ecology an ecology of organizations is a good one to think how we can operate not being the same not agreeing of everything but still operate in yeah in similar directions. Anyway, thanks a lot, Rodrigo. Yeah, I think we are getting very close to the end. I just wanted to give, um, like to sort of ask a final question, which comes also from uh, a few lines of discussion that were happening with the audience. So yeah, we had uh, Eric Meyer, I think he interviewed you before at some point <laughs> about the book. And, but he's asking about, uh, he's picking up a thread that was, that was laid out in our first question in which you spoke about how certain group, like how the book has been useful for certain certain groups and collectives, and um, how the concepts from the book can actually serve practical purposes. So he he wanted to know he wanted to know like if you have examples of that usage, if you could elaborate more on that usage from people around you that spoke about the book. And uh, also, I I have a, a sort of a closing question about that also. Like, because I, I feel that as someone that researches that, you're, you, you have to be very vigilant for interesting trends in political activism and theory at the same time. So what have been some of the most interesting movements, writers or collectives that you have been following also and that have inspired you in uh, writing the book or also in getting a clearer picture of the situation? So in relation to, well, first of all, um, I'd like to say that Eric, I've, I've done three or I'm going to do my third event in Berlin and you're watching the one online rather than coming to any of the live events, honestly. Um, but um, I, I don't actually know, like I've, I've met a few people here in Berlin as well who told me um, they'd found the, the, the book quite useful for the, their political practice. And I think, I think the two concepts that, or the three things that came up the most were the argument around double melancholia, 
uh, I think a lot of people could identify with that, identify with that predicament uh, or identify with that impasse. Um, and, and yeah, like I, I, think, I think they appreciated the fact that I, I was trying to theorize a way out of that impasse, um, which wasn't just, you know, we need to, to take what's good from here and what's good from there. It wasn't like, it was more a way of dissolving the impasse or trying to diagnose the clinical conditions that lead to the impasse and solve that through conceptual therapy. Um, you know, if, if we pose, if we change how we conceive of organization, if we change how we conceive of mediation, uh, if we pose problems in terms of diets rather than in terms of uh, disjunctive, um, of exclusive um, disjunctives, um, all of that, I think, was stuff that they said they found useful. The idea of functions and fitness was another thing that people have raised with me as um, being things that they found very useful because uh, it was, and generally like the approach, uh, an approach that says the, the, the key questions about, um, the, key, the key questions um, when it comes to trying to define, consciously define an organizational form or transform the organizational form that's, that people have spontaneously adopted are uh, what are we trying to do? Um, what are the resources that we have at hand? What are the constraints that we're operating under? And then you find something that fits that um, situation. You know, it's like you, you're writing an equation and trying to find a solution for that equation, which is going to be different because every solution is different. You're trying to do different things with different resources under operating under different constraints. That rather than starting from what's the ideal organizational form? What is the perfect organizational form? What's the organizational form that's guaranteed to always be horizontal and democratic, blah, blah, or that's always guaranteed to be efficient, et cetera. So thinking of organizational problems in terms of fitness, thinking ultimately thinking in, of organizational form, forms in terms of what works rather than a dogmatic a priori position of you know, this is the right thing to do um, was stuff that was something that people said uh, had been very useful for them as well. And the third thing is the concept of ecology and the attempt, which, you know, by the point I write this book, I guess you could say was already a sort of native concept. You know, a lot of people were already employing this concept. It, I think it starts catching on uh, around the time when I wrote uh, Organization of the Organization List. And I think I was one, one of the people at, uh, at the time who pushed this, this concept. Um, but it really becomes a lot more uh, uh, generalized since since then and not not that i'm saying you know it's because people read me blah, blah. it's just um, you know it doesn't matter where these things uh come from it's just started coming from more and more places suddenly more and more people were talking about ecology so by the time i write the book it's already kind of a native concept that lots of activists a lot of lots of organizers are uh, using um and I think people found my effort to try and flesh that concept out and draw some conclusions from it useful, but also people who hadn't been using the concept before um, have told me that they found that a, a useful starting point for framing uh, questions. And now they, they do 
Um, they've started doing ecology mappings uh, for their campaigns. So, you know, they have sessions in which they try to identify, okay, what is the ecology in which we're operating? What are the resources in this ecology? What are the functions that are being already fulfilled within this uh, ecology? What kinds of strategies, what relations do we need to build? What kind of strategies would be would make sense within this ecology, et cetera. So I would, I, I would say from memory, uh, I would say those are the three areas that people have highlighted the most. Was, was there a second? Now I've, I've got a feeling that there was a second question. Was there? Yeah, I, I believe it. Oh, I found you. I believe yeah, it was about... Uh... Uh, yeah, about the interesting things, like interesting movements and writers that you have been following. Right. Um, I mean, sad to say, uh, one of the things that's fascinated, the, fascinated me the most in the last few years is the far right, the way the far right organizes. Uh, and, you know, the success of far right politics. I've been very interested in, in that. And I've, I've been trying to follow that um, and read more about it, but obviously I wouldn't recommend um, any, any sources. I mean, I would recommend sources about them, but not, um, but not, wouldn't recommend any of the far right groups. Um, one thing that I've been getting more into since uh, since the the book, uh, which has been around for for a while, but uh, I've now have the have the time to engage more thoroughly with, is communization theory. Um, which, since my next project is on the concept of transition, obviously, communization theory is kind of a a foil, a, an important. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily describe, and I have the impression from the, you know, the people who work in, in this vein that I've had the chance to speak to, I, I don't have the, the impression that it would be an adversary, but obviously it provides, it, it's definitely a foil in the sense that you know, it builds several arguments against the idea of transition that you have to engage with. Um, And in terms of new movements on the left, I think there's um, uh, definitely the big novelty and already at the time when I was writing the book and I actually engage very little with it in the book um, because I, I sort of had the material, like I've, I've sort of delimited the material I was going to work with a while before I actually had the chance to write the book, which meant that stuff that happened in the meantime was stuff that I was like, okay, I'm going to mention this, but I'm not going to go any deeper into it. But I think the organizational form of extinction, things like Extinction Rebellion and uh, what's called, uh, I think, the last generation in uh, in Germany, which is kind of uh, has kind of occupied here in Germany the the space that Extinction Rebellion has occupied in other places. That's both an example of what I call uh, platform logic in the book. And again, this is something that I have like this discussion on platforms uh, as being a, a paradigmatic form of organization uh, today is something that I have in common with Nick Cernicek, Alex Williams, Jeremy Gilbert, uh, also my, my populist friend, uh, Paulo Gerbaldo. Um, we all have been talking uh, about this. Um, but yeah, at the same time that there are, they are an example of, um, of platform politics, they, 
they go for one extreme of uh, the possibilities uh, of, uh, of platform politics, which is to make very clear from the start, look, we're not offering you a say in the organization. We're not inviting you to discuss strategy. We're inviting you to execute in a strategy that we have developed and will be developing continuously. And this is the ask. You just give us your contact. And whenever we have an opportunity to apply this uh, strategy, uh, we'll just call you and you come along. And I think it's very interesting to think through, you know, I'm not recommending that form, but, you know, as uh, Levi Strauss would say, uh, it's bon à penser. It's interesting to think with it uh, and to think why it works, to think why lots of people respond positively to it. Because in a, in a way, it's a very, it's a very, I mean, it's a, it's a very, it, it's very adequate for a post neoliberal world, not post neoliberal in the sense that neoliberalism is over, but in the sense that we live after it has completely transformed the world in the sense that, you know, people are very precarious. They are very time poor, but also like there is this outsourcing that's involved, you, you know, you want to participate politically, but you don't have the time to do it. And I think one of the, one of the problems with horizontalism that became very clear is that like, it's incredibly time consuming, um, which ends up selecting the kind of people who can participate, which ends up creating all sorts of problems, um, you know, for, for people. So this is like the exact opposite. It's like, oh, no one has time for that anymore. No one has time to have meetings and discuss strategy. So I'm just happy to have someone decide the strategy for me and call me up the day there's an action. And it's interesting that people are going for it. Um, so I think the success of that form is an interesting success to think through. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have any, because that is already like some four, four years old, maybe, or five even. Um, I can't right now think of anything more recent that has caught the eye apart from the far right. Um, truth be told, they had the political upper hand for the last, they were way more active than uh, the left in the last few years. So it's natural that they should attract more attention. The good news is I think we'll, we'll have new stuff to think about soon. I'm pretty confident that there's, there's going to be new stuff soon. Hopefully it will also be good. It's sadly, another thing that we've learned uh, since this uh, theoretical political conjuncture that started in the 90s and maybe ended in the last decade is new doesn't necessarily equal good. Um, but yeah, we'll live, we live and will be living in interesting times. Hopefully. Very interesting answer, Rodrigo. Thank you so much for your participation, for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Rafael and Mateus, for coming for your uh, questions. Uh, we're coming to the time of wrap it up. Uh, I want to uh, thank everyone who's watching, uh, Eric for sending his question, and we will be seeing each other in the next episode of Sheltering Places. Thank you all. Season. Thank you very much for the invitation and the, the great questions. It was great. And I Thank look you. forward to seeing you all in Rio mm -hmm. or Brazil somewhere. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.